to be able to hear that today. And if you take your Bibles, go back to Psalms, Psalms chapter uh, number 22, and uh, we'll get right into it this morning. We've been looking into different things we can see, and today I want us to see the incomparable love, the incomparable love. You know, these last few days, if we have had the opportunity, we have had the opportunity to share and to express our love for our spouse or even our closest friends. If you were part of the mob on Friday, February, Friday night, February 14th in the stores trying to get the last few good flowers or the last few boxes of chocolate, and it was, it was a mad dash, it was a mad scramble for just that one last heart-shaped box of cheap chocolate that, that Walmart sells on sale for $1.99. My wife, my wife and I, as we were getting ready for the Valentine's Maker, we were in there, part of all that crowd, and this poor guy, Ms. Osher just has this talk to me kind of vibe to herself, and we're sitting there, we're getting things ready for the Valentine's banquet, buying a few things, and this poor guy, he came up, he had like six different heart-shaped boxes of chocolate in his hands, and he had no idea. He had this look on his face, you could just tell he just got off work, and he had just completely forgot kind of thing, you know, what do I do now? And so he had all these boxes of chocolate, he just looks over at Angela and says, which one of these should I get for my wife? And he had this, this stack of them. So she's in there helping this poor guy buy a box of chocolates for his wife on the Valentine's night, Friday night. It was just, it was just a mad scramble in there. And I don't know if he got the right box or not. But Miss Oster sold him the most expensive box in there. She helped Walmart out and make a little bit of a profit. But you know, these last few days we've had the opportunity to share. And maybe we buy our wife some flowers and maybe we buy her some different things. I bought my wife a cake, some flowers, some chocolate. What else? I mean, I don't know what else. Our, our house is full of chocolate again. I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, but we do all kinds of things for them. We take them out to dinner. We do different things for them, and maybe the guys, we clean the house for the day or something like that, just do it for them. Just whatever we do for our Valentines, for our time, to express our love, and it's in a time that we can use and do to show how much we love them, even if it's for our children. Children do it at schools. They set up their little Valentine booths or their whatever, and they, everybody passes out cards and tracks and gives out candy, different things like that. We do those kind of things, and we're willing, really, to pay anything or do anything or go anywhere with them and for them, those that we love the most, and for our spouse or for those that hold really dear places within our hearts and within our lives. And our spouses especially, they hold that dear and really an irreplaceable part of our lives. And last night we did our game about how we can know different things. And it's always fun, those that have been married for so long, and you ask them a question, then they go, um, you know, I just don't really know. And that's kind of like, how long have y'all been married? 30, 40 years? You, know, you, don't, you don't know? And it's, and it's fun to be able to think. And we had some really different kind of questions that just really kind of maybe took, oh, I, don't, I never really considered that before. That's kind of an interesting thing. What would happen if a meteor was coming to my house and about to blow it up? What would my wife want me to go get? I don't know if I really know that or not, you know? So we did some different things, some fun things last night, but, but we were willing to do those kinds of things for them. And really, there's, and there's really nothing, honestly, that can separate us from our love for one another. I don't, I don't think there's, there's nothing that would separate Ms. Osha and I from each other. We love each other so much, and, and that love, and we'll do anything we can for each other. And yet, really, honestly, for all of our love, there's nothing that we can say or do for one another that compares to the love that Christ has expressed toward us and that he has shown toward us. Even in creation, think about this, even in creation, he knew that his love for us was going to cost the highest sacrifice possible or the highest sacrifice required so that he could have a relationship with the creation and with his creation, mankind. And he loved us so much that even in creation, even before creation, he decided that he was going to give his life for them. I mean, think about it. He decided he was going to die for you before he even made you. He was willing to die for you. He was willing to give his life for you because he loved you even before he made you, even before he were even considered of or thought of by any other human being. God loved you. And so we can see from our text this morning in Psalms chapter 22, we see a prophecy, we see a prophecy here of what Jesus Christ was going to face upon the cross of Calvary and what he was going to face for us and suffer for us because of his great love for us. And David wrote of his Savior's future suffering. 
the Roman Empire at the time of David's writing of this time, the Roman Empire did not even exist. And at the time, the cruel torture that this, this culture that would employ was really unknown to David. And as he wrote this prophecy, it really had to be interesting and even agonizing, maybe even with a tear shed as he penned the sufferings of his Savior, realizing his deep love for him. And as, John, as David here writes this out, no doubt he knows and he can see and he can see ahead to know that his savior was going to suffer this for him this portion of psalms 22 really was not written from the viewpoint of david it was not written from the viewpoint of a bystander it was not written from a viewpoint of a historian or someone who would tell would would go back and to study it was not written from any of those kind of viewpoints no this part of scripture through the pen and through the pen and the holy spirit leading david wrote this from the viewpoint of jesus christ and from what he saw and as he hung upon the cross and just imagine writing this story and just imagine writing this prophecy from the viewpoint of Jesus Christ and writing it from what he saw and what he experienced and what he went through and he went through all of it because he loved us so much and Jesus allowed David to see the sufferings of the cross through his eyes David saw, Jesus saw his sufferings and cruelty of his death, but still went through the cross because of his deep love for you. And so we can see here from our text in verse number 12 that the text begins from the the events in the Garden of Gethsemane, which are found in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And at that time, Jesus knew that his time was come. He had been on this earth for 33 and a half years and he had been ministering and he had been he had planted his church and he had trained his disciples and he had led many people and he had many disciples and he had all those that were ready to continue the work continue the ministry there as he was about to hang upon the cross and Jesus knew that his time was come and he actually really honestly knew from creation that his time was going to come and he knew that that time was now that he would hang and he would die upon the cross he would shed his blood for us and can you imagine that How People always say, you know, I would just love somebody to come back from the future and tell me what the future is going to be like. But honestly, think about how your life would change if you knew the exact day, time, and the circumstances of your death. How would your life change? I mean, just think about it. If you knew that in three weeks you're going to be driving down I-10 and somebody was going to slam into your car and that was going to be it, do you think you would consider, do I get on I-10 on that day? I mean, think about it. Your life, honestly, if you honestly knew, really, if you were honest to ourselves, our Christians, our, our people today, would change the way that they live. If I, if I knew, if I just knew that this event was going to take place at this specific time and at this place and I was going to suffer in the way that I was going to suffer or I was going to die within the way that I was going to die, honestly, as a human being, we're going to do everything we can to avoid that occasion, to stay away from that occasion or to stay away from the thing that would cause our death or to bring that demise upon us. And if we as a human, well, I'm just going to just pretend like a, come on now, we're human beings. We we already know and we already consider those things. But here was Jesus Christ. He also was 100% God and 100% man. He knew specifically the day that he would be hanging on the cross. He knew specifically the pain and agony that he would be suffering. He knew all of those things as he walked upon the earth. Can you imagine for those three and a half years, as he ministered as he went in and out of Jerusalem he could see Calvary and he knew exactly the time when his cross would be dropped into that hole and his joints will be knocked out of socket as we'll see here in just a little while he knew all of that yet because he loved us so much he still did it He still walked upon that cross. He still carried it. He still hung there upon that cross. And so many times we know that we're going to be experiencing different things for our husbands and for our wives. We always say when we get married, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. There's going to be a lot more poorer than there are richer, probably, honestly. More better or worse. All these different things. We know all those things. Yet because we love that individual and God has placed that love within our hearts, we still are willing to go through that. We're still willing to we're still willing to marry that individual. We're still willing to do those kind of things. And honestly, if you think about it, if we knew the things that were going to happen in our marriage at the time when we were getting married with our rest of our life, how many would not go through with it? Because I don't know if I want to go through that, or I don't know if I want to go through that struggle. I don't know if I want to go through that difficulty. I don't know if I want to face that kind of thing. 
But no, if we were honest about it, if we really knew, but we really loved that individual, so I'll just go through it with them anyway. Because I love them, and I really want to experience those things with them, and I want to have that relationship with them. And so Jesus Christ, as you imagine how he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he, he spends some time in prayer, and he talks to his heavenly Father, and he's knowing these times are there. And remember, Jesus Christ is still 100% human. And how many of us like pain? There could be some people. My daughter Morgan, she... Pain was one of those things that just did not bother her at all. She had a very, very high tolerance to pain. And so she could do all kinds of things that most of us be like, oh, doesn't that hurt? And she'd just be laughing. She, just, she would just keep on going with it. But here's Jesus Christ. Within the next few hours, the next few times, a Roman soldier was going to be whipping him. Yet here he was at the Garden of Gethsemane praying, spending time with his heavenly Father. But at the same time, you've got to imagine his heart may be racing and and as, the, as Judas begins to come to him and Judas is there and he's betrayed by Judas, he still responds in love to Judas. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 50, he refers to Judas as a friend. What sent you here, Judas? He has this love and he has this love for him. Even though he knows, even though he knows that he's there to betray him, he's there with these men to capture him, he's there with these men to begin to bring this crucifixion upon him, the death of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we can see from verse number 12, as, as David begins to write and begins to view from the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. Now imagine verses 13 through verses 19. This is all through the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. So many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. He was captured and surrounded by the best of the Roman army. The Bible says there in Matthew and also in John's gospel that Judas just didn't come by himself. The Bible says that they sent him with many soldiers and they were armed and these men were there and they surrounded him with this massive army of guys and they were there to capture Jesus Christ. And these word, this word Bashan here, this is a specific part of the, to the east of the Sea of Galilee. It was a very fertile area known for crops and cattle and they were known for their bulls they were known for their strong cattle they were known for this and it pictures and it represents the strength in which the world turned against Jesus Christ in which the leaders of the world in which the Pharisees and which the high priests and all those that were there turned against Jesus Christ and with their political power and with their physical power they turned upon Jesus Christ and they came with everything that they possibly could come with they came with an army of men they came with those that were armed ready for battle ready for war just to capture one man. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter 18, verses 13 through 14, that Judas actually called for a band of men and officers fully armed and his binding and delivery to Caiaphas. It would have been a rough thing. The Bible says, we can see from our text here, that these men were not coming to be nice to Jesus Christ. They weren't coming to just kind of slowly greet him as rights and gently put him into the cop car and lead him gently out. No, no, they were really rough with him. They were not kind to him. My brother-in-law is a police officer in Stockton, California. And there are some times when he is rough with the criminals because they did things and they needed some roughness about them. And these men, when they came to Jesus Christ, they came with spears, they came with swords, they came with all kinds of weapons, and they were there to arrest Jesus Christ. And when they bound Jesus Christ, I can promise you, they didn't ask Jesus Christ, um, just you let me know if this is too tight for you, okay? Don't, don't let me pinch this off. I don't want your fingers to turn purple. No, they bound Jesus Christ. You've got to sense the anger here. When Jesus Christ is talking, these bulls of Bashan, they surrounded me round about. Have you ever been in a field with an angry bull? No. I don't want to be. I've seen what happens when people get in a bull, in a pen with an angry bull. There's not much that would mess with an angry bull. And Jesus Christ is trying to get us to help us to get the picture around him. At any point, at any time, Jesus Christ simply could have said a word or two. And thousands of angels would have been right there. And they would have protected Jesus Christ. They would have, they would have, probably, they would have wiped them all out like that but no jesus christ says i love these folks even though they have this anger even though they have they have the strength of the army around them even though they're going to treat me roughly even though they're going to arrest me even though they're going to drag me into a court that will not declare the truth of the word of god to declare any truth at all really they're going to falsely accuse me i still i still love them i'm going to allow them and so here's jesus christ with his anger mob and judas comes along and he said, whom seek ye, friend? 
And there's a really interesting thing that happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says that Judas kissed Jesus Christ and he marked them and they say, we're looking for Jesus Christ. And he said, I am. And the Bible says that they all got knocked to the ground. Do y'all let that, that sink in just for a minute? Here's this huge army of guys. They're all ready for war. Burly, strong men, as even Jesus Christ describes them as bulls from Bashan. These were not just some wimpy soldier men. These were some men. And Jesus Christ, with his words, says, I am. And it knocks them to the ground. I think you'd think that would open somebody's eyes. You're just kind of walking along, and you're here, and he says, I am, and you're knocked back on your back on the ground. You would think that that would wake up somebody. I, that would wake me up if something just somebody said something and it knocked me to the ground. That would have woke me up. Are y'all out there this morning today? Think about this right now. Here they are. And yet with their anger and yet with their hatred of Jesus Christ, they got right back up and guess what they did? They still arrested him. They still bound him. They still pulled him along. They still drug him. Even though they saw, even though at that moment they experienced the power of God. We see in verse number 13, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. The false accusations, the false accusations began. They began to berate Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Lamentations 2 verse 16, All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we looked for. We have found. We have seen it. And it was describing the attitudes of the high priest. I mean from our text here, Jesus Christ was picturing us and helping us to understand. They sought and eventually found false witnesses against him. And they took words out of context and make them seem like they're bad they were doing everything they could to make jesus out like he was a bad person make him out like he was trying to cause divisions make him out like he was trying to spread false doctrines make him out like he was doing something that was wrong against the people and so they gaped upon me with their mouths as ravening and roaring lions they used every false accusation that they could against him i mean they could barely contain themselves this word gaped upon him it's the same picture as that of a roaring lion literally wanting to rip him to pieces yet jesus christ only replied with calm logical loving statements it's titus chapter 2 verse 10 says sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you and they then those that around them may begin to resort to violence but help us understand now jesus christ is sitting and he's sitting with these rulers and they can barely contain themselves. They have such hate and such anger and such rejection for Jesus Christ that they have the attitude of a roaring lion literally wanting, the Bible describes it in different places, wanting to rip the flesh from his body. I mean, think about it. Have you ever been so angry? Be honest. That you just wanted to just kind of just want to just... Bam! You just wanted to do it. Everyone in this room, you're a human being. You've experienced it at least once. You've experienced it at least once. And this was the anger. Got to get the picture. Here's Jesus Christ. And he's here. And these men, as we saw last week, remember last week in, in King Nebuchadnezzar, remember, he was in his rage and he was in his strong rage. It's the same rage here. It's the same attitude. They just, oh man, they, the hatred and the anger for Jesus Christ, the hatred and anger that they had for him to teach that he was God because he is God. And they taught that He is the Messiah. He is the one that died for their sins. He is the one to give them everlasting life. But they wanted their own way. They wanted their own doctrine. They wanted their own teaching. And here was a man who taught that they were the snakes. They were the vipers. They were teaching the false doctrine. And they hated Him with such hatred. They hated Him with such anger that they just couldn't wait till they got their hands on Him. They couldn't wait till they could choke Him. They couldn't wait till they could... I mean, you hear just a little bit. They smote Him. They beat Him. They spit upon Him. They had such anger. They had such hatred. It was palpable. And Jesus Christ said, Man, they came at me as if they were a roaring lion wanting to rip the very flesh from my body. And as he sat in this chamber, and as he sat there, he sat there yet lovingly, yet calmly answered their questions, yet calmly spoke with the men, yet calmly loved them, yet continued to love them, even though he faced this cruelty, even though he faced all of this. 
The Bible says there in verse number 13, They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening, and roaring lions, they began to spit on him. They, they began to buffet him, which means to strike and beat him. They smote him with the palms of their hands, as it says in Matthew 26, verses 66 through 67. John 18, verse 22, they smote him, they beat upon him. They, in their rage and their anger, and he wouldn't turn to what they wanted him to do, and yet they smote him. I mean, have you ever smacked somebody or smacked something with the palm of your hand? Oh, that, it does really, really, really sting. It hurts. And they're trying to inflict as much pain as they could, trying to get Jesus Christ to admit or to turn from the ways, trying to vent their anger. And here was a man, the Bible says that if somebody smites you on the one cheek, what do you do? You turn the other. So what did Jesus Christ do out of pure love? Turn the other cheek. And he took that beating and he took those strokes because he loves you and me. He took those and he took that beating upon us. And as those men spit upon him and as those men assaulted him and as those men poured out their anger upon him, he continued to respond in love. He said in verse number 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my vows. He begins to face the cruelty of the Roman death. The Bible says there in Matthew chapter 26 that he began to be, he began to be, be beaten. He began to be struck. He began to face that judgment upon those of those men. And he began to face those things. And the Bible says here he began to suffer the beatings of the torture of those that would hurt him. And this was the act of putting a criminal what he suffered, what Jesus Christ suffered at the hands of the Roman army, at the hands of the Roman culture. It was the most cruel death in history. It was usually only reserved for the putting away of criminals and those that were, that, those were that they conquered, or those that were the worst of the worst of the worst and can you imagine he was the people that should have been turning to Christ he was the people that should have been falling at his feet and yet they're teaching him and treating him as that of the worst kind of criminal that they could possibly have can you imagine the anger that you have to have for someone to stand there at the same time while you watch him be un unruly unjustly beaten for his love for us so Jesus Christ began to suffer the cruelest death that could be known to humankind. The Bible says that they plaited or weaved a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head and they mocked him as the king of kings and lord of lords and they gave him a reed and they bowed before him mocking him. And the Bible says that they, they took that reed and they beat him on the head with that reed and those nailed those, those, that crown of thorns that they had for Jesus Christ was a special type of thorny bush and they would weave it. That's what that mean, pla word plaited means they weaved it and they wove it so it would be stronger it would be able to hold up better and they took that crown of thorns and they put it upon his head and then they took a reed and they beat that crown of thorns on the top of his head it would have drove it would have drove those thorns into his skull it would have drove those thorns into his brow and here's jesus christ and yet he's taking all of this for you and for me and here he was, and these men would beat him, and these men would strike him on the head, and these men would spit upon him. These men would strike him with the open palm. They would pull his beard, as the Bible says in the Old Testament, and they would pluck his beard, and they'd yank it out. And yet at the same time, he would look back at him with eyes of love because he loved that individual. He suffered that for you and for me. And he suffered it for all of us. And the Bible says there also that they scourged him. In John chapter 19, verse 1, they scourged him with a whip. Most would mention a cat of nine tails, though in the word of God, a cat of nine tails is not specifically mentioned. Most do not live through this part of an event, whether it was a cat of nine tails or whether it was a different type of whip. Most of the Roman soldiers at this time would use a special type of whip, whether it had nine, whether it had, whether it had nine strings or whether it had three. It didn't really matter. The Bible the we know from history that this would be a rope that would have a it would have a handle about maybe a foot and a half long and on the end of the handle would have several strands and they would wrap that strand with different types of glass or different types of rock or different types of stone and, and traditionally especially for the hardest and the highest of criminals they would take a bone claw or a bone tooth and they would tie it to the very very end of it and whether they did it for Jesus Christ is not specifically known in scripture but for many of them times they would make the criminal then make that individual bend over so that as 
they would whip with that whip, that end claw or that end tooth would wrap around the top part of the body. And with a simple flick of the wrist, they could take that and they could take it across the back and they could literally pull flesh from bones and they could literally pull it out. And if you can imagine, Jesus Christ took those stripes. He took those 39 stripes and every single strike, every single attempt was an attempt to strike my Savior. And yet at the same time, the Bible says that he was as a lamb, didn't say a word, and with love. He took every beat for you and for me. He took it for you and me. The Bible says, can you imagine, here in our text, the Bible says, I poured out like water. As of this time, Jesus Christ would be bleeding profusely. Every strike, every pull of the whip, every pull of the lash, every slash of the whip would pull more flesh from the bones and from the body of Jesus Christ. And from most doctors, most historians would say that most do not even live through this event. But yet at the same time, Roman soldiers were trained and they were taught and they had learned to be able to whip an individual so that they bled profusely, and yet they would learn to be able to stop at the moment so that they could live through the cross, but most would never get to that point. But my Savior knew that he had to die upon a cross, and so the Lord gave him the strength as he poured out his life here, and as he was, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. This scourging was meant to severely weaken an individual. It was meant to severely damage an individual. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with with his stripes, we are healed. All we are like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We can see from our text that he suffered, all my bones are out of joint. He suffered dislocation of all his joints. This was likely caused, a combination of different things. It was caused by the drop of the cross and the contortion required to breathe upon the cross. You see, the Romans were masters at torture. The Romans were masters at making people suffer. And so when they would hang a person upon the cross, they would not just hang them in a normal position. They would hang a person in an individual. They would kind of bend the knees up to a certain point. And then they would cross that feet and they would nail that feet into the ground so that your, your, your legs were already at a weird condition contorted angle and they would put the hands and they would put the nails right at the bottom right at the base of your hand because they figured out that the tendons and joints in the lower part of your hand can support the weight of a human body and so they would put those nails in there and they would drive them in there and they weren't just normal kind of nails they were nails meant to grip and they were meant nails meant to be able to hold a person into position and into place and they would drive those nails in there and then because it would go through the center of the hand they would kill the main nerves that would go into your hand so it would convulse your hands into a certain position like this so that would further hold you into place in that position and then they would take those nails and they would drive it through the top part of both feet and they would nail them down into both feet so that when you're in there it would also kill the nerves within your legs and it would kill the nerves at the bottom parts of your feet so that you would come to a point to where your body would literally kind of convulse inward and so as they would drop you into that place into that cross drop you into that ground it would literally smash your body and your body would convulse to a point that would usually pop out pop Bones out of socket. And then to be able to breathe, your arms would be extended as far as they possibly can. And I, can, I challenge you to try it. We tried it with our teenagers. Grab the, grip the insides of a doorway and slump down and see how well you can breathe. You can't breathe. But because of the nails and because of the contortion of the hands and because of the contortion of the feet, because of that and because of that drop and the way that you're hanging upon that cross, you would literally break bones. You would literally suffer suffer uh, dislocation of your arms, your hips, and your shoulders, your knees, everything, trying to push and trying to pull your body to get it into position where you can breathe. But because half of your nerves have been severed, it's an extremely, scru- it's an extremely painful, painful way. And here's my Savior upon the cross. He suffered all this for you and for me. The Bible says that my heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. And this was likely heart failure begins to set in at this time. Blood loss, irregular and shallow breathing. Exhaustion caused heart irregularities. And more than likely, many doctors or many commentators would even say that Jesus Christ died from suffocation combined with aortic shock. The Bible says in verse number 15, My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my mouth cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. 
Before Jesus Christ was hung upon the cross, before he was stood up, Jesus was offered vinegar mixed with gall. And this was, a temp, this was an attempt by the Romans. They learned that this mixture served as a pain reliever to allow for torture to be slightly prolonged. And Jesus took that in Matthew 27, verse 34. This word potsher means hard-fired. It's, it's a hard-fired, easily broken clay vessel, and it pictures the vital organs that would be drying up. They would be failing from dehydration, from loss of blood, and it would have been extremely difficult for this kind of an individual, for anyone, to be able to survive much longer, to be able to survive much, much at all. And it took great effort to cry unto his father and to be able to speak. And the Bible says there in verse number 16, For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You see, it would have taken great effort. And he took just enough fluid. And just enough fluid later, we remember the phrase, he said, I thirst. And he took just enough fluid to make his final statement, It is finished. The Bible says in John chapter 19, verse 30, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But before all that took place, he suffered the scorn of the people. You know, John 1 11 says, He came into his own, and his own received him not. Matthew 27, verse 39 through 42, shows the picture of that statement. And they passed by, reviled him again, wagging their heads and saying, Thou destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him come down, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. That was a lie. I mean, if they wouldn't believe the miracles, if they wouldn't believe the dead raised from the dead, if they wouldn't believe all the miracles that Jesus Christ did, had he crawled off the cross, which he was well within his power to do so, because he was still God. He had that power. The angels were there to protect him. He could have done that. But had he got off the cross, they still would not have believed because they had rejected Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of all. And instead of accepting him as their Lord and personal Savior, they watched as his body slowly dried, as his body slowly failed, as his body slowly gave in. And then he made a great statement. Jesus Christ made a great statement. Verse number 8, 19, But he be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste to help me. But here's these folks. They would not believe his words. They would not believe his miracles. And they would not believe him now. Because you see, believe the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They've had plenty of times they, they could have believed him before. In fact, they lauded their ability to nail him to the cross. Zechariah 13, 6 says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer those which with, with which I was wounded, in the house of my friends, my own people rejected me. When the gruesome scene was finally realized, you see the Roman lictors, those that would have taken place with the scourging, were extremely proficient at tearing flesh to the point of being half dead. The Bible says in Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. They did all that. Because he loved us. Because he loved you and me. He faced the scorn of the people and the rejection of the Father. And it was just a normal torture to the Roman soldiers. They didn't, they didn't believe who he was. Therefore, when they parted his garments, as we can see from our text in verse number 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. This was just a game to the Roman soldiers. This is something that they just normally did. In fact, there were two other malefactors that were hanging on the cross next to Jesus Christ. This was a normal traditional practice for the Roman soldiers. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ, so whatever it's make of, they parted his garments among them. In fact, Jesus Christ's coat was especially made without a seam, and so that was, just a, that was just a better price that they could win. They cast lots and said, who does we get for Jesus' garments? But really the saddest part of the cross, it's not the suffering, it's not the pain and agony, it's not the blood. It was the rejection of His heavenly Father. We can see in Psalm chapter 22, verse 1, we see the phrase, we see the cry that Jesus Christ made. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? And we see from verse 19, Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. The cry of Jesus Christ upon the cross is repeated in Matthew 27, verse 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, all the sufferings, all the beatings, all the hatred, all the punches put upon the face, all the spitting, all the beatings upon the head with the crown of thorns, all of those things, none of those compared to the pain and agony that my Savior suffered as he took my sins upon him upon the cross. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked up, and because God has no fellowship with darkness, with sin, as we've already studied from 1 John chapter 1, my God, my Savior, He suffered a separation from the Heavenly Father as His Father turned His back upon Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ bore my sins upon the cross. And He bore those sins upon those that were making fun of Him. Those soldiers that parted His garments, those soldiers that had no idea who He was. He died for them. He bore their sin upon him, upon the cross, because he loved them. And because he wanted them to have a relationship with his heavenly Father. And so because he had my sin, because he had your sin, because he had the sins of the world, he had to suffer the separation from his heavenly Father, and his Father forsook him because he had my sin. You see, my sin caused my Savior to hang upon a cross. My sin is like my Savior had to suffer the beating and torture of a Roman scourge. It's my sin. Nothing can compare to the love of Jesus Christ. I may be willing to die for my wife. I may be willing to give my life for my children, for my family. But I've never suffered a Roman soldier beating me. I've never suffered that. I've never gone through that. Nothing can compare to the love that Jesus Christ had, and that he shed for me, his blood that he shed for me upon the cross. But you see, blood must be shed for the putting off of sin. And perfect blood, a perfect lamb is required to put away our sins forever. First Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was for, for or ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God and raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. You see, Jesus' Father turned his back on his Son as my sin and as your sin, as the sins of the world were placed upon him. And he was the only one that could pay our sin penalty. He was the only one that could suffer. He was the only one that could survive the cross. And yet he did it for you because he loves you. Because he wants you to have a relationship with God. Because He wants you to have a full home in heaven. He wants you to have everlasting life. And He did it for us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2.24 Who His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. Oh, what uncomparable love that our Father sent His only Son to die on a cross for you and for me. You see, my Savior did all of this for you because He loves you. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. See, Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of love. Nothing any man can do for any other can compare to the sacrifice of Christ for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would a right for a righteous man will one man die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus still loves you. He still wants to give you everlasting life. Rome, Isaiah 118, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Questions this morning are these. Would you accept the incomparable love of Jesus Christ for you? David had the opportunity to pen this suffering of Christ through the view of Jesus Christ. But down through history and down through ages, Jesus Christ saw you. 
and he loved you. And though men were beating him, though men were scourging him, though men were putting a place of thorns upon his head, though men were mocking him, though men were watching him die, though a man spears him in the side, though men were, would watch him suffer, though men would mock him, he still saw me. He died for me because he loved me. And he wanted me to have everlasting life. He wants you to have everlasting life. He wants you to have a home in heaven as well. So would you accept the incomparable love that Jesus Christ has for you? Would you accept it? Christian today, would you be willing to fall before Christ and thank Him for His incomparable love for you? Have you honestly just truly considered what Christ did for you upon the cross? Would you consider it? Would you fall before Him at an altar and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for suffering on a cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for suffering for me. No one else has done that for you. Christ has. Would you be willing to commit to sharing that incomparable love to others? Would that God's people have a burden to fall before Christ and say, God, give me souls, give me people, give me individuals that I can share the love of Christ with. Because there are many, 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 there are thousands, there are millions, even in America alone, that have never heard, have no idea that a man called Jesus, God, the Son of Man, shed his blood for them. He loved them and he died upon a cross for them and they have no idea what he suffered and died. So that they can have everlasting life. We got every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. It's Valentine's weekend. It's Valentine's weekend. It's our opportunity to show the love of Christ to our loved ones, to our spouse, to those that mean so much to us. But my friends, nothing we can do can ever compare to the love that Christ showed for you and displayed for you. Nothing can compare. Would to God that His people would recognize just exactly what God did for them. Change their life. But we forget. Yes, I'm a child of God. Yes, I accept in Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. But when's the last time you just really honestly took the picture and the view of the cross from Jesus Christ's eyes as he shed his blood for you and died for you. Maybe there's one here today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. My friend today, Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you in an incomparable display of love. All you must do to have everlasting life is believe and repent. And he'll give you everlasting life. He paid your sin debt. Paid your penalty. Upon the cross. By shedding his blood for you. Child of God. When was the last time you fell before him. And thanked him. For shedding his blood for you. Thanked him for. Showing his incomparable love for you. When was the last time you had a burden for the lost. He died for them. He shed his blood for them. Would to God that his people would be more willing to commit to sharing that love. 